All right, here we here we go. First presentation: Knowledge is Power. Anthony Christie, Sergey Negroshop, and Nathan Miramatsu. Uh, well, hello everybody. My name is Sergey. And I'm Anthony. I'm Nathan. Uh, and we're here to talk about our project, uh, Knowledge is Power Cube. So our motivation was to build a power analyzer, or at least a power meter, uh, to use for educational purposes and to study AMI of the budget of oh, about twenty dollars. Um, and then we would also like to move beyond just power metering and go into actual quali power quality analysis and look at power quality and maybe even look at the grid state uh, kind of from the outside in. And we've already started this a little bit and one of the things that we are going to talk about is we were able to implement frequency measurements. And with those frequency measurements, that's something that a lot of the power tools and the power meters don't do unless you buy a $200 meter or a $500 meter. So for $20, we're able to get some of that power quality information in there with the frequency. There are some of the related work here is our device as well as a few other ones on the market. Uh, we kind of rank them on basis of scalability, sensitivity, and of course the price range. Uh, so we are communicating with the outside world through Swish and Ethernet uh, IP version 4, uh, which gives us scalability to uh, pretty much any number of devices. Uh, we're sensitive down to about half a watt, uh, and the frequency sensitivity is about 0.1 hertz, uh, which is pretty reasonable, especially considering the $20 price range. Uh, there is other projects like the kilowatt, which doesn't scale at all. There's just a little SD card that you can record the data on. Uh, it's pretty sensitive and it can also record frequency and it's within the reasonable price range. Uh, the TED 500 is uh, scalable through IP version 4 and IP version 6. Uh, and it sim features the similar sensitivity to what we have, uh, although the price range is $200, which is outside of uh, what we would like to be. Uh, finally, there is this Acme UC Berkeley uh, project which is uh, purely a power meter uh, so it's not sensitive to frequency changes at all and it doesn't try to record them at all uh, however it's very scalable through 2.4 gigahertz uh, wireless range and IP version 6 left on top of it uh, and the price range is reasonable however because they can't they're not sensitive to uh, power quality uh, we wanted to develop something better uh, finally, there's the Big Dogs, the National Instruments Power Quality Analysis, expandable through pretty much any e interface you want, from fiber to uh, compact PCI, uh, with sensitivity limited usually by the Pro with 24-bit ADCs, uh, sampling at 50 kilosamples per second. Uh, however, the price range is, puts you in a little bit of a shock from eight to $30,000. Uh, so the basic concept of our project is we have a couple of these inductive sensors, uh, which are non-intrusive sensors, uh, show, uh, they kind of just clamp around the wire. I don't know if you can see that. Mm -hmm. um, and they produce a current proportional to the current which is passing through the wire. Uh, that current is uh, buffered through our hardware and our board. Uh, it is digitized by a little MCU uh, in the board. Uh, and then it's packaged uh, according to the protocol that we'll discuss later. Uh, and it's sent over to the software uh, for readout and analysis. So I designed the board, so we'll talk about the hardware a little bit. Um, here's the board in all its glory. Uh, we use these non-invasive uh, current sensors. It goes into the analog stage for buffering. Uh, once again, we have the microcontroller, which is the 18 mega 320 key, uh, which then passes the data over the SPI protocol to the Ethernet Mac. Uh, which is uh, ENC 28G60. Uh, uh, so at the analog stage, uh, we have two different probes and we decided to terminate them differently. Uh, so one probe is good from 0 to 10 amps, which is something you would see in a household circuit. The other probe is good for 0 to 100 amps, which is more of like monitoring a house or uh, heavy equipment. Uh, we have a preamp buffer uh, of unity gain, so it doesn't amplify anything, but it purely just buffers the input uh, for the our ADC to read out. We have the microcontroller and the Ethernet pack. Uh, the microcontroller digitizes uh, the input signal to 10 bit precision and then it packages that signal into uh, packets and it's responsible for responding to commands from the software. So it's purely a server, it doesn't do anything of its own. Um, the Ethernet Mac we're using is only good up to 10 megabits per second, but that's good enough for our purposes. We're not really moving that much data. Uh, here's the schematic for the Ethernet Mac and the microcontroller, and here's the Mac jack we're using. Sitting on top right, of and all of these schematics can be found online on the wiki for our Google project hosting, which we'll show you guys at the end of our presentation. 
All right, so I'm Nathan, and I did the firmware installation of this uh, board. So our code is in C. Uh, the tool we use is the J, uh, JCC toolchain. And uh, we put the C program onto our board using um, AVR do to bootstrap it um, onto the, our microcontroller. And we did provide the make files, which uh, Anthony just talked, we'll show you a little bit later. Um, and I just uh, built everything. So what we added onto our board um, in terms of features is that we can, um, well actually uh, for the ADC, the microcontroller can uh, change the sampling rate depending on uh, what you set the, um, your clock to, for instance. We can also set the MAC address, the IP address, um, and the ID. The, these uh, features will allow the board, um, in terms of uh, when you actually want to do something scalable, this will differentiate the boards as, um, uh, for instance, if you uh, just leave it how it is, it'll, it'll get the default ones and they'll end up having like the same uh, values. But with this, we're able to actually change them so that um, we'll be able to scale it properly. And so, uh, in, uh, in terms of something that we we did, we actually set up uh, a sampling delay in case you uh, you don't want to deal with the, the CPU, for instance, or anything like that. Um, another feature of this chip is that you can plot uh, the communication between of uh, the um, when communicating with the, the Ethernet chip. You're, you're actually able to set the how big you want the RX and TX buffer for memory spaces. Uh, and um, the lastly, uh, of, of course, you can communicate over the internet using um, uh, UDP, which we already probably discussed. Uh, next. So if you want to jump it more into it, like uh, you already know all this stuff or something like that, uh, we uh, looked inside the uh, data sheet for the, my, uh, for the Ethernet chip, and we're able to, uh, for instance, be able to change the hardware type, protocol type, um, how it's broadcast, uh, broadcast, how it's how is it communi um, how it transmits, and as well as uh, the pattern matching for the packets. So, for instance, if the patterns don't match, uh, packet won't be received. The mask doesn't um, not mask, but uh, we're actually able to change the mask, so we're able to, able to choose uh, what bytes um, are read. Uh, um, if you don't know what multicast or unicast is, multicast is uh, from uh, from one transmission we're able to send it out to like a group. Uh, unicast is one to one. Uh, protocol type um, is zero A, which was for the eight hundred two networks because we're using I think an ARP. Uh, so. so yeah. Um, so basically, I mean, yeah. So what we get out of all of this is the firmware is completely customizable, which is important because yes, we have one board right now, but the schematics, source, all of the software is open source. So what we can then do is, if somebody wants to take our project from the Google uh, project page and build their own boards, they can easily go in, modify the firmware for whatever they need to modify, and it's very easily customizable. And the nice thing Nathan was mentioning about the firmware is about setting the IP address, the MAC address, and the ID is whenever these boards come on, they start up with the default IP address and MAC address. And if we have multiple boards, and if they all have the same IP and MAC address, you can't obviously have them on the same network. So one of the things that I'm going to show you with my software, the KIPP software, is it also allows me to do deployments. Um, so that if we have multiple boards using the KIPP software, we can set the individual ID, IP, and MAC addresses of the boards. So that allows us um, to do great scalability like Nathan mentioned. So up here is a diagram that just shows what exactly the KIPP software is in charge of. So the KIPP software is going to read UDP packets from either the KIPP board or the emulator. So the last time I showed you this presentation, it was from the emulator. Now it's from the board. So as you can see, the board's sitting up here on the table. And then from the board, we have an Ethernet cable coming over to this router. And then as we get a close up. So the Ethernet cable is coming over here then and connecting to this router. This router is now broadcasting wirelessly over to Serge's computer. 
um, so that whenever we want to get packets from the, door, from the board, we'll be getting them via UDB packets. So we can get them either from the board, or like I mentioned, there's also an included emulator, which is a module. It's a part of our software project. Um, so if you don't have the board, you can use the emulator to test you know, what your software looks like, what kinds of readings you get, um, and so forth. So what exactly does the software do? Um, well, it does a lot. And you know, maybe one slide doesn't give it justice. But once it gets a UDP packet, uh, that UDP packet contains a bunch of power samples. right? So we're getting voltage measurements. We're getting individual DAC readings for two different current channels. And we need to take those readings and somehow make sense out of them. So my software does that. My software allows us to do three things. The first thing, like I said, is deployment. It allows us to set the ID, the MAC address, and the IP address on the board. The other two things are we can view information in real time, which I'll show you during the demo, and we can also save those packets for later and analyze them at a later date and get a little more information about those packets. Um, so the different things that we're calculating, we're calculating the frequency, um, we're calculating current on two different channels, and we're also calculating the power. Um, and then once we have this data, what can we do with it? Like I said, we can display the data in real time, and we can buffer that data. So I have these real-time charts that keep scrolling. And we can set the buffer for however many data points we want to store in there. We can change how often those panels update. Um, the software is completely configurable through a nice, easy configuration file that simply uses uh, key value pairs. And you can find the entire documentation to that configuration file on the wiki. Um, and like I said, we can store packets for later analysis. We can do detailed packet analysis. We can go into each individual packet um, marked by the time that we receive the packet and view the DAC measurements, the calculated frequency, the calculated voltage, the current, et cetera. Um, and board configuration and deployment I already mentioned. So, um, uh, so future work on the board level, uh, as old prototypes that had some problems, uh, one of them was the voltage measurement, which we didn't quite get to because uh, there are parts that are still in the mail somewhere. Another one is the current preamp was meant to be an amplifier, but it was miswired. Uh, but we're just using it as a buffer, and it seems to do OK. However, these would be nice to fix. Uh, and then there is some slow screen issues on the bottom of the board, which don't affect it uh, electrically. But it'll be nice to fix as well. Um, in terms of firmware, uh, we weren't able to get it to um, the interface. Uh, this would allow the microcontroller to be, um, you know, it will actually able to have states at that point. So we'll be able to put it inside the low power mode. Uh, this is something that we would, uh, if, we're look, uh, if we're working further on uh, the board, we would like to do. Um, yeah. And then finally in software, um, once the board showed up, it sort of changed our focus from getting it to work with the real-time database to actually getting it to work with the board. So that's one of the things we don't have yet. I mean, we do have persistent storage in the fact that once I receive a bunch of packets to my software, I can save all of those to a text file. Um, that's obviously not as convenient as we would like it to be. I can save the packets to a text file. I can also load the packets back from the test file. And we can analyze those packets in the Packet Explorer. But we really want some sort of database, persistent storage. Um, we would love to use a real-time database so that we can really make this project a complete AMI solution. And with that, we wanted to have security on top. We did start working on some SSL modules for the software. We're able to uh, connect to uh, servers and communicate with them over SSL. We just never got the database implemented. And then finally, once we have the database up, um, we would like to be able to integrate it with Watt Depot, right? a sensor for Watt Depot, so that Watt Depot can pull the data um, that we receive from our board. So we would just like to thank some people. Oh, OK. So I would like to uh, thank Garush uh, Socher and Pascal Stang. Uh, these uh, we were looking at, uh, for me anyway, I was looking at these uh, firmware codes extensively. And towards the later part of our project, we ended up uh, using them because they had GPL version 2 um, licenses. So we were actually able to do that. And uh, thanks to Professor Johnson for lighting a fire under our bets the entire semester and pushing us along and uh, actually getting us interested in this really interesting technology that I really knew nothing about before taking this class. Uh, I'd like to thank the Instrument Development Lab at the Physics Department at UH Manoa uh, for extensive support and answering lots of questions and letting me use their facilities for board assembly. Do um, you guys have any questions? Otherwise, we'll move on to it now. All right. Okay. okay.
Oh, did it open on the other screen? Yeah. yeah. There it is. Okay, so when the software starts up, um, we're looking at nothing. And we can go ahead and change. So there's three different things up here. That's really out of focus. Uh, there we go. Okay. So there's three different parts of this. Like I said, we can do board um, deployment. And there's a menu up here for board configuration where we can go through and set the board's ID, IP address, MAC address. We can also <laughs> set how often the board samples. And then there's a command to reset the board. So anytime you actually set the ID, IP, or MAC, all that does is store that information in the board's EEPROM, and it doesn't take effect until the board is reset. So once the board is reset, it reloads the EEPROM, and whichever values are in there are the values it uses. So we can go through and change the board configuration with that. This is our little control panel, and the control panel will allows us to say which board are we connecting to, which address is it at, which port is it listening on. The hertz is how many times per second do we want to pull the, door, the board for data. And then finally, this last field, the duration is how long do we want to pull the board for. And you can set that value to negative one to continuously pull the board until you hit the cancel button over here. Um, and before I start pulling data, let's just take a look. We have a panel for the real-time data, and we also have a panel for the Packet Explorer, which allows us to go through and view information on individual packets. So let's go ahead and start pulling and take a look at our real-time graphs. So oh, let me set that to negative one so it continuously pulls instead of just pulls for a single second. All right, send triggers. So right now what we're seeing is we're seeing all of the packets that we are sending and receiving. All of these packets with a bunch of numbers are packets that we're receiving from the board. Um, you can turn off these messages in the configuration file by setting debug to zero. But if we take a look at the real-time data. Nothing is going on because uh, right now we're connected to this uh, lamp and the lamp is off, of course, but we were to turn it on. Uh, you can see our frequency resolution is, uh, it goes back to 60. Good. Uh, so it's a 40 watt light bulb, as you can see, it's showing 40 watts, or at least in the ballpark. Uh, it will show you the current uh, for how much current is flowing through the wires. And um, do you want to look at the packet experience? Yeah, sure. I was just amazed by this. I always, do, I always am when I see this thing. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and cancel pulling the board for now because we don't need to do that for the Packet Explorer. So the Packet Explorer, we hit refresh, and we can then go through and look at all of the packets. Um, they're organized by year, month, day, hour, minute, second. And then these packets aren't going to have anything in it because this is what we were pulling when the light bulb was turned off. So let's grab one of the packets from down here. Um, doesn't matter which. And we can actually see the waveform of the two different current channels coming from the light bulb. So each one of these individual packet has 64 samples, which we can look at in detail. So these are the different waveforms that we're getting from the light bulb. So as you can see, the probes are terminated one for 0 to 100 amps and one for 0 to 10 amps. So this is the 0 to 10 amp. So the light bulb doesn't draw a whole lot of power. Uh, so this one gives us a much better precision uh, in terms of uh, just the general shape of the half of the AC pulse. The other one doesn't do so well, however, if you hook it up to something which is 100 amp, this will just read the maximum at all times and this guy will actually give you a decent current measurement. Right. And then finally, um, you might want more details about each packet. So there's a page over here that just has all of the details. Um, this is for, you know, mainly we use this a lot for debugging, but if you want that kind of fine-grained detail, it's easy to get. We have the two different frequency channels, the current channels, the amps, uh, the watts, and then we also have the DACs for the voltage and the two current channels. So you can see the individual values for each data point um, that's being displayed in the plot before us. So we're going to switch gears quick, and we're going to let this light bulb cool off, and we're going to put in a higher light bulb to show that, you know, it actually works with drawing more energy. And in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and show you guys our Google Project hosting page. So our Google Project hosting page is simply Knowledge is Power, the name of our project. Um, the front page simply has a beautiful picture of our board and a quick description of what it is. Um, we got a lot of things up on here right now. There's in the download section, well, there's actually a lot in the download section. Um, oh, I've got to switch networks because I'm connected to that router right now. Um, let me switch networks really quick. So you said I got to turn wireless off first. And now you can just connect to it. Connect to it. Okay. That's connecting right now. I'm going to have internet back in half a second. Come on, internet. All right, got it. 
So um, we can check out the download section. The download section has our presentation. It has a zip folder of the binary kip software that I just showed you. It has all of the pictures we put up there. Um, and then there is uh, the Gerbers for the board. There is a couple of PDFs, one for the layout, one for the schematic for the board. And then finally, there is all the files that I used for actual bird design. It's designed in Mentor Graphics, uh, which is uh, pads, PCB, layout tool. Yeah, so that's all under the download section. Of course, all of our source code, firmware, and software can be browsed and pulled uh, via SVN. So it's all pushed to repository on Google Project Hosting under SVN. Um, what else do we got on here? Oh, well, I'll show you our wiki last because that's probably the coolest. Um, there's also a link down here. There's two external links. One of them is to our Java documentation for the KIP software. It's simply hosted on the UHENX right now. And then there's also a screencast that I put together. It's a seven minute screencast uh, with specific instructions on how to use the KIP software and the different features of the KIP software. That's, a, that's posted on YouTube, so you can check that out whenever you'd like. And then finally, we have a nice wiki with all kinds of stuff on it. Um, every, our entire project is documented on this wiki. Oops, all right, so um, we can go through. It's nice and labeled correctly, but there's wikis for firmware, software, FAQ, protocol, flashing the board, the emulator, the KIP configuration file, building the KIP software, running the KIP software, and finally the board. And we can just check out a few of these. I don't want to take up too much time, but um, let's take a look. Like the protocol shows our protocol really nicely. And everything's just formatted. So you can see the, the, the protocol we're using, all of the values um, are put into nice tables. We can also check out, I keep losing the mouse on the other screen. Um, the configuration files documented the same way. There's things for building the software, running the software, um, all of the different options that we actually have in the software. So you can check this out in your own time, but all of the documentation for the entire project is there. So we're gonna go ahead and switch gears back and turn the light bulb back on in a second. I gotta uh, reconnect the WLAN. This is the random light bulb I found in the drawer, so I have no idea what the wattage it is, but uh, I guess we're about to find out. You're going to have to turn it on. I do. Yeah, yeah. Right. We're reconnecting the WLAN right now. OK, let's hide the browser. Uh, oh, where did that make the software disappear to? There it is. OK. Um, one of the things I can do here is I can clear all the packets we've already saved. I'm going to go ahead and do that so that um, all of these, all the data is for the new light bulb. All right, so we're going to go ahead and start pulling the board again. And we're pulling it at five hertz, and here we go. Good. So instead of 40 watts, we're, it looks like we have a 90 watt light bulb. Amazing. Now we're close to 90 at least. The frequency is still reading correct at around 60 hertz, which is about what we would expect. Current looks good, and that's that. Let me go ahead and cancel it. Uh, we can take a look at this one in the Packet Explorer also again. It's probably not going to make much of a difference. It's not going to look too much different from the last light bulb. Um, if you want to see a real difference, we'd have to use test this on something that pulls a little more power, like a microwave or what have you. But you can see that these sinusoidal waves on the bottom are a little bit nicer now since we are drawing slightly more power. Uh, one thing to consider is, uh, so these two transformers are connected out of phase. So that gives us a waveform on both phases of the power uh, on top of each other. If you were to flip them, then you would have them completely out of phase. So you'll have the peak over here for one and the peak over here for the other, as you would expect of the power grid. Um, I think that's about all we have. Yeah, that's our project. Thank you very much. All right, way to go.